All right, guys, welcome back. So what we are going to be doing in this video is we are going to be reading chapters two and chapters three of TKM. So let's review chapter one. So when we read a chapter one first, um, we got to meet our main character, Scout, who is our narrator. She's the six-year-old girl who is telling the story um, that took place in her childhood. So this is all one big flashback. So she introduces us to several characters in chapter one. One, she introduced us to her big brother, Jim. Um, she also introduced us to Atticus, her dad, who is the town lawyer, um, as well as Calpurnia, who is the housekeeper in her house. Um, and then we also got to meet Dill, who is a, a friend who likes to come visit um, his Aunt Rachel in the summer. And so the kids like to get into trouble um, with, uh, with him when he comes to hang out. And then we got a lot of backstory over Boo Radley. All right, so part one, we're just looking at Boo Radley's character for the most part, okay? Um, so who is Boo Radley? Remember, he was that creepy neighbor that we talked about in our intro video um, where he, you know, has said that he poisons kids and he, he eats raw animals and his hands are bloodstained and he's like seven feet tall and all of these crazy rumors uh, have been made up about Boo Radley. And we got to see a lot of his backstory um, in chapter one. And then we even had Jim try to go up and touch the house as part of a dare. And that's not going to be the only time that um, Jim and Scout and Dill get into a little trouble when it comes to Boo Radley. But we have to ask ourselves as a reader, would we go up to somebody's house who is rumored to poison children? Probably not right? I mean, it's not like going to a haunted house, right? That's like a real situation. Um, and so we're going to continue on with that with chapters two and chapters three. So the purpose of uh, these first few chapters are really introducing characters, but what is that doing? That's helping us get to know our narrator, helping to develop future conflict. Lots of things are being developed in these first few chapters. Chapter two is Scout's first day at school. All right, so let's see how it goes for her. So follow along as I read. Um, and we'll talk about it. So chapter two, Dill left us early in September to return to Meridian. We saw him off on the five o'clock bus and I was miserable without him until it occurred to me that I would be starting school in a week. I never looked forward more to anything in my life. Hours of winter time had found me in the treehouse, looking over the schoolyard, spying on multitudes of children through a two powered telescope Jim had given me learning their games, following Jim's red jacket through <laughs> wriggling circles of blind man's buff, and secretly sharing their misfortunes and minor victories. I long to join them. So it sounds like Scout really wants to go to school. Jim condescended to take me to school the first day, a job usually done by one's parents. But Atticus had said Jim would be delighted to show me where my room was. I think some money changed hands in this transaction, for as we trotted around the corner past the Radley place, I heard an unfamiliar jingle in Jim's pocket. When we slowed to a walk at the edge of the schoolyard, Jim was careful to explain that during school hours, I was not to bother him. I was not to approach him with requests to enact the chapter of Tarzan and the Ant-Man, to embarrass him with references to his private life, or tag along behind him at recess or noon. I was to stick to the first grade and he would stick to the fifth. In short, I was to leave him alone. You mean we can't play anymore? I asked. We'll do like we always do at home, he said. But you'll see, school's different. It certainly was. Before the first morning was over, Miss Caroline Fisher, our teacher, hauled me up to the front of the room and patted the palm of my hand with a ruler. Then made me stand in the corner until noon. So it doesn't sound like Scout's first day is going too good. Miss Caroline was no more than 21. She had bright auburn hair, pink cheeks, and wore crimson fingernail polish. She also wore high-heeled pumps and a red and white striped dress. She looked and smelled like a peppermint drop. She boarded across the street, one door down from us, in Miss Maudie, Miss Maudie Atkinson's upstairs front room. And when Miss Maudie introduced us to her, Jim was in a haze for days. Miss Caroline printed her name on the blackboard and said, this says I am Miss Caroline Fisher. I am from North Alabama from Winston County. The class murmured apprehensively. Should she prove to harbor her share of peculiarities indigenous to that region? When Alabama seceded from the Union in January um, 11th, on January 11th, 1861, 
Winston County seceded from Alabama, and every child in Maycomb knew it. North Alabama was full of liquor interests, big mule steel companies, Republicans, professors, and other persons of no background. Miss Caroline began the day by reading us a story about cats. The cats had long conversations with one another. They were cutting, they wore cunning little clothes and lived in a warm house beneath the kitchen stove. By the time Mrs. Cat called the drugstore for an order of chocolate malted mice, the class was wriggling like a bucket of catawba worms. Miss Caroline seemed unaware that the raggedy, denim-shirted, and flower-stacked, skirted first grade, most of whom had chopped cotton and fed hogs from the time they were able to walk, were immune to imaginative literature. Oh, and that's my bell. Miss Caroline came to the end of the story and said, oh my, wasn't that nice? Then she went to the blackboard and printed the alphabet in enormous square capitals, turned to the class and asked, does anybody know what these are? Everybody did. Most of the first grade had failed it last year. I suppose she chose me because she knew my name. As I read the alphabet, a faint line appeared between her eyebrows. And after making me read most of my first reader and the stock market quotations from the Mobile Register aloud, she, one second. Sorry, guys. She discovered that I was literate and looked at me with more than faint distaste. Miss Caroline told me to tell my father not to teach me any, inter, uh, anymore, that it would interfere with my reading. Teach me, I said in surprise. He hasn't taught me anything, Miss Caroline. Atticus ain't got no time to teach me anything, I added. When Miss Caroline smiled and shook her head, why, he's so tired at night, he just sits in the living room and reads. If he didn't teach you, who did? Miss Caroline asked good-naturedly. Somebody did. You weren't born reading the Mobile Register. Jim says I was. He read in a book where I was a bullfinch instead of a finch. Jim says my name's really Jean Louise Bullfinch. That I got swapped when I was born, and really I'm a... Miss Caroline apparently thought I was lying. Let's not let our imaginations run away with us, dear, she said. Now tell your father not to teach you any more. It's best to begin reading with a fresh mind. You tell him I'll take over from here and try to undo the damage. Ma'am? Your father doesn't know how to teach. You can have a seat now. I mumbled that I was sorry and retired meditating upon my crime. I never deliberately learned to read, but somehow I had been wallowing illicitly in the daily papers. In the long hours of church, was it then, then that I learned? I couldn't remember not being able to read hymns. Now that I was compelled to think about it, reading was something that just came to me, as learning to fasten the seat of the, my union suit without looking around, or achieving two bows, um, bows from a snarl of the shoelaces. I cannot remember when the lines above Advocates' moving fingers separated into words, but but I had star uh, stared at them all the evenings of my memory, listening to the news of the day, bills to be enacted into laws, the diaries of Lorenzo Dow, anything Atticus happened to be reading when I crawled into his lap every night. Until I feared I would lose it. I never loved to read. One does not love breathing. Very powerful line. I knew I had annoyed Miss Caroline, so I let well enough alone and stared out the window until recess when Jim cut me from my covey of first graders in the schoolyard. When he asked how I was getting along, I told him. If I didn't have to stay here, I'd leave, Jim. That damn lady says Atticus has been teaching me to read um, and for him to stop it. Don't worry, Scout, Jim comforted me. My teacher says Miss Caroline's introducing a new way of teaching. She learned about it in college. It'll be in all the grades soon. You don't have to learn much out of the books that way. Like, if you want to learn a cow, you milk one, see? Jim, yeah, Jim, but I don't want to study cows. I, sure you do. You have to know about cows. That's a big part of life in here in Macomb County. I contented myself with asking Jim if he had lost his mind. I'm just trying to tell you the new way they're teaching the first grade stubborn. It's the Dewey Decimal System. 
Having never questioned Jim's pronouncements, I saw no reason to begin now. The Dewey Decimal System consisted of part, in part, of Miss Caroline waving cards at us, uh, which were printed the, cat, rat, man, and you. No comment seemed to be expected of us, but the class received the impressionistic revelations in silence. I was so bored, so I began a letter to deal. Miss Caroline caught me writing and told me to tell my father to stop teaching me. Besides, she said, we don't write in the first grade. We print. You won't learn to write until you're in the third grade. Calpurnia was to blame for this. It kept me from driving her crazy on rainy days, I guess. She would set me up with the writing task by scrawling the alphabet firmly across the top of a tablet, then copying out a chapter of the Bible beneath. If I reproduced her penmanship satisfactorily, she rewarded me with an open-faced sandwich of bread and butter and sugar. In Calpurnia's teaching, there was no sentimentality. I seldom pleased her, and she seldom rewarded me. Everybody goes who goes home to lunch, hold up your hands, said Miss Caroline, breaking into my new grudge against Calpurnia. The town children did so, and she looked over us. Everybody who brings his lunch put it on top of his desk. Molasses buckets appeared from nowhere, and the ceiling danced with metallic light. Miss Caroline walked up and down the rows, peering and poking into lunch containers, nodding if the contents pleased her and frowning a little at others. Well, she stopped at Walter Cunningham's desk. Where is yours? She asked. Walter Cunningham's face told everybody in the first grade he had hookworms. His absence of shoes told us how he got him. People caught ho uh, hookworms going barefoot in the barnyards in the ho hog wallows. If Walter had owned any shoes, he would have worn them the first day of school and then discarded them until midwinter. He did have on a clean shirt and neatly mended overalls. All right, that shows a lot, right? He doesn't have a lot of money, but he's trying to appear um, the best he can for his first day of school. Did you forget your lunch this morning? Asked Miss Caroline. Walter looked straight ahead. I saw a muscle jump in his skinny jaw. Did you forget it this morning? Asked Miss Caroline. Walter's jaw twitched again. Yes, he finally mumbled. Miss Caroline went to her desk and opened her purse. Here's a quarter, she said to Walter. Go and eat downtown today. You can pay me back tomorrow. Walter shook his head. No, man, thank you, ma'am, he drawled softly. Impatience crept into Miss Caroline's voice. Here, Walter, come and get it. Walter shook his head again. When Walter shook his head a third time, someone whispered, go on and tell her, Scout. I turned around and saw most of the town people in the entire bus delegation looking at me. Miss Caroline and I had conferred twice already, and they were already looking at me as an innocent assurance of that familiarity breeds understanding. I rose graciously on Walter's behalf. Um, Miss Caroline, what is it, Jean Louise? Miss Caroline, he's a Cunningham. I sat back down. What, Jean Louise? Remember, Jean Louise and Scout are the same people. Uh, Scout's just the nickname. I thought I had made myself sufficiently clear. I was clear. It was clear enough to the rest of us. Walter Cunningham was sitting there lying his head off. He didn't forget his lunch. He didn't have any. He had none today, nor would he have any tomorrow or the next day. He had probably never seen three quarters together at the same time in his life. I tried again. Walter's one of the Cunninghams, Miss Caroline. I beg your pardon, Jean Louise. That's okay, ma'am. You'll get to know the country folks after a while. The Cunninghams never took anything they can't pay back. No torch, church baskets, no script stamps. They never took anything off, um, off of nobody. They can get along with what they have. They don't have much, but they can get along on it. My special knowledge of the Cunningham tribes, one branch that is, was gained from the events last winter. Walter's father was one of Atticus's clients. Remember, Atticus is a lawyer. After the jury conversation in our living room one night after, about his entailment before Mr. Cunningham left, he said, Mr. Finch, I don't know when I'll ever be able to repay you. Let that be the least of your worries, Walter, Atticus said. When I asked Jim what entailment was, Jim described it as a condition of having your tail in a crack. I asked Atticus if Mr. Cunningham would ever pay us that. Not in money, Atticus said. But before the year is out, you'll be paid, you watch. Or I'll be paid, you watch. We watched, and one morning, Jim and I found a loaf of stowwood in the backyard. 
Later, a sack of hickory nuts appeared on the back steps. With Christmas came um, a crate of Similax and holly. That spring, we found a crocker sack full of turnip greens. Atticus said Mr. Cunningham had more than paid him. Why does he pay you like that? I asked. Because that's the only way he can pay me. He has no money. Are we poor, Atticus? Atticus nodded. We are indeed. Jim's nose wrinkled. Are we as poor as the Cunninghams? Not exactly. The Cunninghams are country folks, farmers, and the crash hit him, them the hardest. Atticus said professional people were poor because the farmers were poor. As Macomb County was a farm country, nickels and dimes were hard to come by for doctors and dentists and lawyers. Entailment was only a part of Mr. Cunningham's fixations. The acre is not entitled or mortgaged to the hilt, and the little cash he made went to interest. If he held his mouth right, Mr. Cunningham could get a WPA job, but his, his land would turn to ruin if he left it. And he was willing to go hungry to keep his land and vote as he pleased. Mr. Cunningham, said Atticus, came from a set breed of men. As the Cunninghams had no money to pay a lawyer, they simply paid with what they had. Did you know, Attic said Atticus, that Dr. Reynolds works the same way? He charges some folks a bushel of potatoes for the delivery of a baby. Miss Scout, if you give me your attention, I'll tell you what entailment is. Jim's definitions or very nearly accurate sometimes. If I could have explained these things to Miss Caroline, I would have saved myself some inconvenience and Miss Caroline's subsequent mortification. But it was beyond my ability to explain things as well as Atticus, so I said, you're shaming him, Miss Caroline. Walter hasn't got a quarter at home to bring you, and you can't use any stove wood. Miss Caroline stood uh, stock still. She grabbed me by the collar and hauled me up to her desk. Jane Louise, I've had about enough of you this morning, she says. You're starting off the wrong button every way, my dear. Hold out your hand. I thought she was going to spit in it, which is the only reason anybody in makeup held out his hand. It was a time-honored method of sealing oral contracts. Uh, wondering what bargain we had made, I turned to the class for an answer, but the class looked back at me in puzzlement. Miss Caroline picked up a ruler, gave me a half dozen quick little pats, and told me to stand in the corner. A storm of, of laughter broke loose when it finally occurred to me that the class, um, to the class, that Miss Caroline had whipped me. Miss Caroline threatened it with a similar fate. The first grade exploded again, becoming cold sober when, only when the shadow of Miss Blount fell over them. Miss Blant, a native Macomian, had yet uninitiated the mysteries of the decimal system, appeared at the doors with hand on her hips and announced, If I hear another sound from this room, I'll burn up everybody in it. Miss Caroline, the sixth grade, cannot concentrate on the pyramids for all this racket. My sojourn in the corner was a short one. Saved by the bell, Miss Caroline watched the class file out for lunch. As I was the last to leave, I saw her sink into her chair and bury her head in her hands. Had her conduct been more friendly towards me, I would have felt sorry for her. She was a pretty little thing. All right, so that's chapter two. All right, so Scout's first day of school was not nearly as good as we um, may think it is. All right, so let's see what happens in chapter three with Walter Cunningham. All right, the boy that she was standing up for. Catching Walter Cunningham in the schoolyard gave me some pleasure. But when I was rubbing his nose in the dirt, Jim came by and told me to stop. You're bigger than he is, he said. Remember, Scout's very rough and tough. She likes to fight. He's as old as you nearly, I said. He made me start off on the wrong foot. Let him go, Scout. Why? He didn't have any lunch, I said, and explained my involvement in Walter's dietary affairs. Walter had picked himself up and was standing quietly listening to Jim and me. His fists were half cocked. And I was expecting an onslaught from both of us. I stomped at him to chase him away, but Jim put out his hand and stopped me. He examined Walter with an air of speculation. Your daddy, Mr. Walter Cunningham from Old Sarum? He asked. Walter nodded. Walter looked at me, um, looked as if he had been raised on fish food. His eyes, as blue as Dill Harris's, were red rimmed and watery. There was no color in his face except the tip of his nose, which was moistly pink. He fingered the straps of his overalls, nervously picking at the metal hooks. Jim suddenly grinned at him. Well, come out and dinner with us, Walter, he said. We'll be glad to have you. And dinner here is really lunch. The kids would go home for lunch, for school, and then they would go back to school. 
Okay, so he's just, this is still the first day of school. It's just during that, uh, that noon time. Walter's face brightened and then darkened. Jim said, our daddy's a friend of your daddy's. Scout's here. She's crazy. She won't fight you anymore. I wouldn't be too certain of that, I said. Jim's free disposition of my pledge irked me. But the precious noontime minutes were ticking away. Yeah, Walter, I won't jump you again. Don't you like butter beans? Our cow's a real good cook. Remember, cow is Calpurnia. Walter stood where he was, biting his lip. Jim and I gave up, and we were nearly to the Riley place when Walter called, Hey, I'm coming. When Walter caught up with us, Jim was pleasant and made pleasant conversation with him. Hank lives here, he said cordially, pointing to the Radley place, Radley house. Ever heard about him, Walter? Reckon I have, said Walter. Almost died first year I came to school and ate them pecans. Folks said he poisoned them and put them over on the school side of the fence. Jim seemed to have a little fear of Boo Riley now that Walter and I walked beside him. Indeed, Jim grew boastful. I went all the way up to the house once, he said to Walter. Anybody who went up to the house once ought to know or not ought to still run every time he passes it, I said to the clouds above. And who's running, Miss Pris? You are, when ain't anybody with you. By the time we reached our front steps, Walter had forgotten he was a Cunningham. Jim ran to the kitchen and asked Calpurnia to set an extra plate. We have company. Atticus greeted Walter and began a discussion about crops. Neither Jim or I could follow. Reason I can't pass the first grade, Mr. Finch, is I had to stay out every spring and help Papa with the chopping. And there's another, and there's another at the house now that, uh, now that's field size. Did you pay a bushel of potatoes for him? All right, which means there's no more younger kids. Um, I asked, and Atticus shook his head at me. Look, don't say that. While Walter, uh, while Walter piled food on his plate, he and Atticus asked together like two men of the wonderment of Jim and I. Atticus was expounding upon farm problems when Walter interrupted to ask if we had any molasses in the house. Molasses is like uh, maple syrup. Or that's kind of what it tastes like. Atticus summoned Calpurnia who returned bearing this syrup pitcher. She stood waiting for Walter to help himself. Walter poured the syrup on his vegetables and meat with a generous hand. He would have probably poured it into his milk glass had I not said what the Sam Hill he was doing. The silver saucer clattered when he placed the pitcher, when he replaced the pitcher, and he quickly put it in his, uh, his hands on his lap, and then he ducked his head. Atticus shook his head at me. Mm-mm. But he's gone and drowned his dinner in syrup, I protested. He's poured it all over. It was then that Calpurnia requested my presence in the kitchen. She was furious. And when she was very furious, Calpurnia's grammar became erratic. When in tranquility, her grammar was as good as anybody's in Maycomb's. Atticus said Calpurnia had more education than most colored folks. When she was squinted down at me, the tiny lines around her eyes deepened. There are some folks who don't eat like us, she said fiercely. You ain't, but you ain't called to contradict them at the table when they don't. That boy's your company. And if he wants to eat up the dinner, dinner, the tablecloth, you let him, you hear? He ain't company, cow. He's a kind of ham. Hush your mouth. Don't matter who they are. Anybody sets foot in this house, your company. And don't you let me catch you remarking on their ways, you so high and mighty. Your folks might be better than the Cunninghams, but it don't count for nothing the way you're disgracing them. And if you can't fit to act to eat at the table, you can just sit here and eat in the kitchen. All right, so Calpurnia is getting on the scout pretty hard. All right, Calpurnia sent me through the swinging door to the dining room with a stinging smack. So she got spanked too. So she's not having a good day. I retrieved my plate and finished dinner in the kitchen. Thankful though that I was spared the humiliation of facing them again. I told Calpurnia, just wait, I'd fix her. One of these days when she wasn't looking, I'd go and drown myself on the Barker's Eddie, and she'd be sorry. Besides, I added, she had already gotten me in trouble once today. She had taught me to write, and it was all her fault. Hush your fussing, she said. Jim and Walter returned to school ahead of me. Staying behind to advise Atticus of Calpurnia's inequities was worth a solitary sprint past the Radley house place. She likes Jim better than she likes me anyhow, I concluded, and suggested that Atticus lose no time packing her off. Have you ever considered that Jim doesn't worry her half as much? Atticus's voice was flinty. 
I have no intention of getting rid of her now or ever. We couldn't operate a single day without Cal. Have you ever thought about that? You wouldn't, you think about how much Cal does for you and you mind her, you hear? I returned to school and hated Calpurnia steadily until a sudden shriek shattered my resentments. I looked up to see Miss Caroline standing in the middle of the room, sheer horror flooding her face. Apparently, she had revived enough to preserve her um, in her profession. Is alive! The male population of the class rushed, her, um, rushed as one to her assistance. Lord, I thought she was scared of a mouse. Little Chuck Little, who's patient with all living things, was phenomenal. And said, which way to go, Miss Caroline? Tell us where he went. Quick, D.C. He turned to the boy behind him. D.C., shut the door. We'll catch him. Quick, man, where'd he go? Miss Caroline pointed a shaking finger at the floor, not at the desk, but to a hulking individual unknown to me. Little Chuck's face contracted, and he said gently, You mean him, ma'am? Yes, I'm, he's alive. Did he scare you in some way? Miss Caroline said desperately, I was just walking by when it crawled out of his ha ha hair. It just crawled out of his hair. Little Chuck grinned broadly. There ain't no need for, to fear a cootie, ma'am. Ain't you ever seen one? No, you don't. You don't be afraid. Just go on back to your desk and teach us some more. All right, so what's happening is a little boy has lice, and the lice is jumping out of his hair. Okay. Little Chuck Little was another member of the population who didn't know where his next meal was coming from, but he was a born gentleman. He put his hand under her elbow and led Miss Caroline to the front of the room. Now, don't you fret, ma'am, he said. There ain't no need for your cootie. I'll fetch you some cool water. The cootie's host showed not the faintest interest in the furor he had wrought. She searched the scout forehead um, above his forehead and located the guest and pinched it with his um, thumb and forefinger. Miss Caroline watched the process in horrid fascination. Little Chuck brought water in a paper cup and she drank it gratefully. Finally, she found her voice. What's your name, son? She asked softly. The boy blinked. Who, me? Miss Caroline nodded. Birth Yule. Miss Caroline inspected her roll book. I have a Yule here, but I don't have a first name. How do you spell your first name? Or would you spell your first name for me? Don't know how. They call me Burris at home. Well, Burris, said Miss Caroline, I think we'd better excuse you for the rest of the afternoon. I want you to go home and wash your hair. From her desk, she produced a thick volume, leafed through its pages, and read for a moment. A good remedy for birth, I want you to go home and wash your hair with lye soap. When you have done that, treat your scalp with kerosene. What for, missus? To get rid of the uh, cooties. You see, Burris, the other children might catch them, and you wouldn't want that, would you? And the boy stood up. He was the filthiest human I'd ever seen. His neck was dark gray, the back of his hands were rusty, and his fingernails were black deep to the quick. He peered at Miss Caroline from a fist-sized clean space on his face. No one had ever noticed him, probably because Miss Caroline and I had entertained the class most of the morning. And Burris, said Miss Caroline, please bathe yourself before you come back tomorrow. The boy laughed rudely. You ain't sending me home, Mrs. I was on the verge of leaving. I done done my time for this year. Miss Caroline looked puzzled. What do you mean by that? The boy did not answer. He gave a short, contemptuous snort. One of the elderly members of the class answered, He's one of the Yules, ma'am. And I wondered if this explanation would be as unsuccessful as my attempts. But Miss Caroline seemed willing to listen. Whole school's full of them. They come the first day every year and then leave. The truant lady gets them here because she threatens them with the sheriff. But... She gives up trying to hold him. She reckons she carried out the law, just getting their names on the roll and running them here the first day. You're supposed to mark them absent for the rest of the year. What about their parents? Asked Miss Caroline in genuine concern. Ain't got no mother, was the answer, and their paws were at contentious. We'll meet all about Bob Yule, who's the dad of the Yule family soon. Burris Yule was flattened by the recital. Been coming to the first uh, day of the first grade for three years now, he said expansively. Reckon if I'm smart this year, they'll promote me to the second. Miss Caroline said, sit back down, please, Burris. And the moment she said it, I knew she made a serious mistake. 
The boy's condensation flashed to anger. You try and make me, missus. Little Chuck Little got to his feet. Let him go, ma'am, she said. He's a mean one, hard down mean one. He's liable to start something. And there's some little folks in, uh, here. He was among the most diminutive of men. But when Burns Yule turned around uh, towards, towards him, Little Chuck's right hand went to his po pocket. Watch a step, Burris, he said. i soon kill you as look at you. Now go on home. Burris seemed to be afraid of a child half his height. Miss Caroline took advantage of his indecision. Burris, go home. And if you don't, I'll call the principal, she said. And I'll have to report this anyway. The boy snorted and slouched leisurely to the door. Safely out of range, he turned and shouted, Report and be damned to ye. Ain't no snot, no slut of a school teacher ever born can make me do nothing. You ain't going to make me go nowhere, missus. You remember that. You ain't making me go nowhere. All right, so this little eight-year-old is cussing out his teacher. Real good, real good family. He waited until he was sure he was, she was crying, and he shuffled out of the building. Soon we were clustered around her desk, trying in various ways to comfort her. He was a real mean one, below the belt. You ain't called on to teach folks like that. Them ain't Maycomb's ways. Miss Caroline, not really. No, you don't fret, ma'am. Miss Caroline, why don't you read us a story? The cat thing was real fine this morning. Miss Caroline smiled, blew her nose, and said, thank you, darlings. Dispersed us and opened a book and mystified the first grade with a long narrative about a toad frog that lived in a hall. When I passed the Radley place for the fourth time that day, twice at full gallop, my gloom had deepened to match the house. If the remainder of the school year were as fraught with drama as the first day, perhaps it would be mildly entertaining. But the prospects of spending nine months refraining from reading and writing made me think of running away. By late afternoon, most of my travel plans were complete, and when Jim and I raced up... Um, raced each other up the sidewalk to meet Atticus coming home from work. I didn't give him much of a race. It was our habit to meet Atticus from the moment we saw him around the post office corner in the distance. Atticus seemed to have forgotten my noontime fall from grace. He was full of questions about school. And my replies were monosymbolic and he didn't press me. Perhaps Calpurnia sensed that my day had been a grim one. She had let me watch her fix supper. Shut your eyes and open your mouth and I'll give you a surprise, she said. It was not often that she made crackling bread, and she said she never had time, but with both of us at school today, had been easy one for her. She, she knew I loved crackling bread. I miss you today, she said. The house got lonesome long, about two o'clock. I had to turn the radio on. Why, Jim and I and me's ever in the house unless it's raining? I know, she said, but one of y'all use always on calling distance. I wonder how much of my day I spent just calling after you. Well, she said, getting up from the kitchen chair. It's enough time to make a pan of crackling bread, I reckon. You run along now and let me get supper on the table. Calpurnia bent down and kissed me, and I ran along, wondering what had come over her. She had wanted to make up with me, and that was it. She had always been too hard on me, and she had seen the air of her fractitious ways, and she was sorry and too stubborn to say so. I was weary from today's crimes. After supper, Atticus sat down with the paper and called, Scout, ready to read? The Lord sent me more than I could bear, and I went to the front porch. Atticus followed me. Something wrong, Scout? I told Atticus I didn't feel very well, and I didn't think I could go to school anymore if that was all right with him. Atticus sat down in the swing and crossed his legs. His fingers wandered to his watch pocket. He said that was the only way he could think. That was the only way that he could think. He waited in an amiable silence and sought to reinforce, and I sought to reinforce my position. You never went to school and you did all right, so I'll just stay home too and you can teach me like granddaddy taught you and Uncle Jack. No, I can't, said Atticus. I have to make a living. Besides, they'd put me in jail if I kept you at home. Dose of magnesia for you tonight and school tomorrow. It was like medicine that tasted really gross. I'm feeling all right, really. I thought so. Now what's the matter? Bit by bit, I told him of the day's misfortunes. And she said, you taught me all wrong. So you can't ever read to me anymore. Please don't send me back. Please, sir. Atticus stood up and walked to the end of the porch. When he completed his examination of the wisteria viant, he strolled back to me. First of all, he said, if you can one, learn one simple trick, Scout, you'll get, a learn, you'll get along a lot better with 
all kinds of folks. You never really understand a person until you consider things from their point of view. Sir? Until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. Attica said I had learned many things today, and Miss Caroline had learned several things herself. She had learned not to hand something to a Cunningham, for one thing. But if Walter and I had put ourselves in her shoes, we had seen it was an honest mistake on her part. We could not expect her to learn all of Maycomb's ways in one day, and we could not hold her responsible for when she knew no better. I'll be dogged, I said. I didn't, I didn't know no better than not to read to her, and she held me responsible. Listen, Atticus, I don't have to go to school. I was bursting with a sudden thought. Burris Yule, you remember? He just goes on the first day of school. The truant lady reckons she carried out the law when she gets his name on the roll. You can't do that, Scout, Atticus said. Sometimes it's better to bend the law a little in some cases. In your case, the law remains rigid. So to school, you must go. I don't see why I have to when he doesn't. Then listen. Atticus said the Yules had been the disgrace of Makram for three generations. None of them had done an honest day's work in his recollection. He said that some Christmas uh, when he was trying to get rid of a tree, he would take them down and show me where they, where and how they lived. They were people, but they lived like animals. They can go to school anytime they want to. And when they show up, the faintest symptom of wanting an education, said Atticus, there are ways of keeping them in school by force, but it's silly to force people like the Yules into a new environment. But if I didn't go to school tomorrow, you'd force me. Leave it at this, said Atticus dryly. You, Miss Scout Finch, are the common folk. You must obey the law. He said the Yules were the members of an exclusive society made up of the Yules. In certain circumstances, the common folk judiciously allowed them certain privileges by the simple method of becoming blind to one of the Yules' activities. They didn't have to go to school for one thing. Another thing, Mr. Bob Yule, Burris's father, was permitted to hunt and trap out of season. Ah, because that's bad, I said. In Maycomb County, hunting out of season was a misdemeanor at law and a capital felony in the eyes of the populace. It's against the law, all right, said my father, and it's certainly bad. But when a man spends his relief checks on green whiskey and his children have a way of crying from hunger pains, I don't know of any landowner around who would begrudge those children any game their father can hit. Mr. Yule shouldn't do that. Of course she shouldn't. But... He'll never change his ways. Are you going to take out his disapproval on his children? Your disapproval on his children? No, sir, I murmured and made a final stand. But if I keep going to school, we can't ever read anymore. That's really bothering you, isn't it? Yes, sir. When Atticus looked down at me, I saw the expression on his face that always made me expect something. Do you know what a compromise is? He asked. Bending in the law? No. It's an agreement reached by, two, by mutual concessions. It works this way, he said. If you'll concede the necessity of going to school, we'll go on reading every night just as we always have. Is that a bargain? Yes, sir. We'll consider it sealed without the usual formality, Atticus said when he saw me preparing this bit. As I opened the front door, Atticus said, by the way, Scout, you better not say anything at school about our agreement. Why not? I'm afraid our activities would be received as considerable disapprobation by the more learned authorities. Jim and I were accustomed to our father's last will and testament diction, uh, and we were always at times free to interpret Atticus for a translation when it was beyond our understanding. Huh, sir? I never went to school, he said. But I have a feeling that if you tell Miss Caroline we read every night, she'll get after me, and we wouldn't want her after me. Atticus kept us in fits that evening, gravely reading columns of print about a man who sat on a flagpole for no discernible reason, which was reason enough for Jim to spend the following um, Saturdays aloft in the treehouse. Jim sat from after breakfast until sunset and would have remained overnight had not Atticus severed his supply lines. I had spent most of the day climbing up and down and running errands for him, provided him providing him with literature, nourishment, and water, and was carrying him blankets for the night when Atticus told me if I paid no attention to him, Jim would come down. And Atticus was right.
All right, that is the end of chapter three. All right, so lots of things were happening. We saw Scout's first day of school, and we met two important characters. We met Walter Cunningham as well as Burris Yule. Now, we will soon know why we got to know all about the Yule family. Um, if you remember our intro, Remember, the Yules are um, the family that is accusing Tom Robinson of raping Mayella in part two. So it's a really, really important chapter. All right. So make sure to log into Thribus to see your next task. Bye, guys.